Uh, so I get the opportunity to speak this morning um, as Matt is, is out on vacation. I don't think he's walking with donkey, um, but he might be. Uh, but I get to finish up kind of our series on Romans chapter 8. And we've been discussing what most scholars would call uh, the greatest chapter in all of Scripture in Romans chapter 8. Uh, Matt, uh, Pastor Matt talked the first week uh, about uh, Romans 1, or 8, 1 through 17. And he talked about that we have the greatest news that's been heard. And that news is that we have no condemnation any longer held against us because of what Jesus has done. And that now we serve as co-heirs with Christ. Uh, the second week, uh, last week, I had the opportunity to talk about hope in suffering. And that we have a hope to come because of what Jesus has accomplished. And that our hope is what sustains us in those difficult times. And so this morning, I get the opportunity to talk uh, about the ending part of Romans 8. What is probably uh, one of the greatest passages of Scripture that you could ever read. And, and, and it's incredible because it gives us this hope that we have the greatest victory in our hands. We have the greatest victory in our hands. So, if you have a Bible, I'd love for you to flip to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. You know, we all love a good uh, come-from-behind story, right? We all love to watch people who seem like they're on the bottom, and they rise to the top to succeed and to win it. It evokes emotions inside of us, right? Like joy and happiness and, and excitement or potential. Like, that could be me one day. So I want to share a couple with you this morning that maybe will, will trigger some of those emotions for you. There's this author by the name of J.K. Rowling. And J.K. Rowling wrote these terrible books called Harry Potter. <laughs> I can't, I've never read them. I'm sure they're fine. Uh, but J.K. Rowling, the cool thing about her is that she submitted her book to 12 different publishers, and all 12 of them told her no. And it wasn't until the 13th publisher actually published it, and now... Stats say that she's richer than the queen, which I find funny. There's another guy. This guy by the name of Colonel Sanders. Now, Colonel Sanders, don't worry, I'll make a good joke later. Colonel Sanders uh, tried 1,008 times to sell his chicken recipe and couldn't. I think rightfully so. But anyways, 1,008 times. And in 1,009th time... Somebody said yes, and he created this incredible brand called KFC, the number two chicken brand in America, of course, behind Chick-fil-A, because God doesn't lose. <laughs> this last one, is, uh, is, it might be a little touchy for some of you in the room this morning, but this past Sunday, the Eagles beat down that awful team up north. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> there are many that have come to me this morning and said, we're cutting you from our roster, it's fine, it's good. Cool. <laughs> At the end of the day, you didn't walk home with a trophy, so I don't care. <laughs> but you see, the Eagles were one of those big underdog teams, right? They were told, you lost your starting quarterback, you're out. There's no way that this good-for-nothing guy named Nick Foles, who's about to retire and, and, and doesn't have any talent at all, can come in and lead this team, and, well, we all saw how that turned out. You see, we love those stories. I'm sure someday they'll write a movie about the Eagles winning a Super Bowl, and you'll all go watch it because you love the emotion that comes out when you watch the victory of somebody else, right, and hoping that one day that could be you. So Romans chapter 8, the end of it ought to evoke the same emotions out of us. It ought to evoke that joy and anticipation and hope and excitement and confidence that we have watching, knowing that that person or that team is going to succeed. Now, to give you a little bit of context to Romans chapter 8, it's written by this guy named Paul who was a church planter by trade. And so he would go around and start church after church after church. He writes this book. Uh, this letter to this church in Rome while in Corinth on one of his missionary journeys. And he sends it to the church in Rome uh, because he has a deep affection for them. 
He's never been to Rome at all, but he desires to be there. And he doesn't know, but in a couple of years, he will be there just as a prisoner, not as a missionary. Which, honestly, being a prisoner is probably the best kind of missionary because they ain't going anywhere. You get that opportunity to share over and over and over again. And so you can just imagine the people that were in Paul's cell block. Like, just shut up. (laughs) We get it. Right? So let's take a look at Romans chapter 8 this morning. First thing I want us to see is that we have the greatest advocate before us. We have the greatest advocate on our side. An advocate, of course, being somebody who is fighting for you, who is taking your place in so, so, so let's take a look at Romans 31, or Romans 8, verse 31. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Now, I want us to understand uh, something that's said right here at the front end. He says, what shall we say about such wonderful things? So the question is, naturally, what things is Paul talking about? Is he talking about Romans chapter 8? Well, I think there's a, a bigger picture to the story of what's happening here. I think Paul is drawing our eyes back to the beginning of Romans, to the beginning of his letter. And he's saying, look at all of the things that I've told you and recognize that because of all of these things, this is true. In Romans chapters 1 through 3, Paul talks about God's judgment on us and that God rightly can judge us because we as people who have done things that are bad or wrong, have sinned against God and broken that relationship. But in Romans 3.21, there's a pivot, a shift. And there's a shift that Paul says, but God's righteousness has come in Jesus. And in Romans 4, Paul says, not only has God's righteousness come, but for you to accept it, is required, the only requirement is faith alone, and that faith ought to change you. In Romans 5, he says that not only should you accept this righteousness and be made perfect, but the relationship that's been broken has been made to, to be reconciled to one another. That the relationship that was in the garden in Genesis chapter 3, sin enters the world and breaks this relationship between God and man. And Paul says in Romans 5, that relationship has been brought back together again. In Romans 6 through 8, Paul talks about how the Spirit of God has come and has has dwelt inside of us to give us strength, to give us power, to give us hope, to give us confidence. And then in Romans chapter 8, as we studied over the last couple of weeks, Paul says not only that, but we see that we have the greatest news that's ever been told, that we are co-heirs with Christ that we have hope in the gospel, and now that we are victorious. So Paul says, in light of all of these things, if God is for us, who can ever be against us? And then he looks at verse 33. Who dares accuse us, whom God has chosen for his own? No one. For God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. And he is sitting in the place of honor, God's right hand, pleading for us. Paul asks these three questions, right? Who can be against us? Who dares to accuse us? And who will condemn us? All of them rhetorical with the answer being nobody. No one can. And he's kind of drawing our attention back to Romans 8.1, it says this, that there is now no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ, right? Paul recognizes something incredible, that we have been freed. And when that freedom comes, when we are liberated from that, something happens. So Paul says there's this great advocate, right? Look at the end of verse 34. He says that Jesus is now sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us on our behalf. Last week we said that the Spirit is interceding, praying on our behalf. Now we see that Jesus is equally pleading before God on our behalf. And so we see this incredible truth that freedom has come. There is this uh, guy 
in uh, the early Roman Empire by the name of John Chrysostom. Now, John Chrysostom uh, is an incredible uh, missionary pastor, teacher, but he was brought in before the Roman emperor, and he was asked, basically, to stop being a Christian, or I will banish you from my empire. And and I want to read to you uh, the dialogue between the emperor and John Chrysostom. I want you to see what happens. Check this out. So the emperor says, I'm going to banish you if you will not stop being a Christian. Chrysostom says, you can't banish me because this is my father's house. I've updated the language so that we can understand it. The emperor looks back. He says, well, I'll kill you. Chrysostom says, you can't because my life is hid with Christ. The emperor looks back and he says, all right, I'll take all your treasures. No, you can't. Because my treasure is in heaven. My heart is there as well. The emperor looks back and says, well, I'll drive you away from man. And I will make it so you have no friends. Chrysostom says, you can't. Because I have a friend in heaven for whom you can't separate me from. I defy you, emperor, yes. For there is nothing that you can do to me. Now that is confidence in the freedom of God and recognizing that we have one who's fighting for us. Chrysostom understood something important, that true freedom, true genuine freedom in life comes with freedom in the spirit and security in the love of God. When we are freed from the judgment and the guilt and the shame when that lifts off of our shoulders, then we are truly free to live with confidence our lives that the Lord has set before us. And that freedom gives us security in the love of God. I I think about a plane ticket. I flew to Atlanta this week for a conference uh, for three days on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Now the thing with a, a plane ticket you have to have one to get on the plane, right? Like, that's a pretty basic fact. I'm not teaching anything new this morning so far, right? Now, when you get to the airport, you check in, you get your plane ticket, you walk to the gate. If you have a ticket, you walk with a little bit less stress, right? You go, you sit down. I got there, and I got my ticket. I sat at the gate. I ate my Jersey Mike's. I FaceTimed my kids because they were at home waiting on me. And I just... Relax. When they called my number, I stood up, I went, got on the plane, flew home. But there was another guy in Atlanta who didn't have a ticket. You see, he had missed his flight to get back to D.C. and was trying to get on our plane. He was trying to get to Baltimore. And so, the, of course, the attendant was like, well, it's kind of full because we like to fill our flights. So you're going to be on standby. Now, that guy's attitude was one of pacing, right? Phone calls, like, I don't know if I'm going to make it. Trying to make different reservations. Mine was relaxed, calm, composed, waiting. I had confidence, like, I'm getting on this plane and you're not, buddy. (laughs) Right? You see, we equally have a plane ticket as well. If you're a Christian this morning, your ticket has been issued by God. Issued by God alone purchased by Jesus through his death on the cross and confirmed to the Spirit's work in your life. If you are a Christian this morning, you get to walk in the same confidence I got to going to the plane because you have been secured in Christ, not because of you, because it wasn't purchased by you. Your your credit card would bounce. It was purchased by Christ alone. So we see that, first of all, we have the greatest advocate, but also we see we have the greatest conqueror. The greatest conqueror. Look at verse 35. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? You see, oftentimes people think that trouble is going to separate us from love, right? 
But isn't it true that when the worst times come, we run to the people that we love the most? You see, when difficulties come, when we're hurting the most, we run to the people that we love the greatest because they provide us comfort. They provide us security. They eliminate the fears of our lives. I saw this greatest uh, this week. So if you were here last week, you'll know that my kids uh, graciously passed around a stomach bug around our house. Um, I blame, of course, the daycares and schools first. So they gave it to my kids, and then it went from my daughter to my son to my wife. Somehow it missed me. I'm not sure why, but it did. This week, we flew out on Tuesday. I got a call on Tuesday that my son has the flu. Rejoicing amongst the crowd. Wednesday, I get a call. My daughter has the flu. So we fly my wife home, and I stayed in Atlanta, but she flew home. home. And uh, now she probably does have the flu. Yay! And so far, I'm good. But I'll still fist bump you just in case. (laughs) But do you know what happened when my kids got the flu? They called us uh, to let us know what was going on. And my son didn't call and say, Hey, Dad, can I get some Tamiflu? Um, Hey, hey Dad, I think I need to go to the doctor. I'm not feeling too sharp. Hey, hey, Dad. Ugh. I don't want to have to leave school, but I'm pretty sure I'm not feeling great. No, my son called, and you know what he said? Can you guys come home? I don't feel so good. Now, why would my son not want to go to the doctor? Why would he want me and my wife? Because our fears go away in the places of greatest security. And for my children, there's no more secure place than with us. For you this morning, I doubt that any of you walked into the room terrified that you might not walk back out. You view this as a safe place, as a place of hope and encouragement. And it is. Our intention is for that to be exactly what you experience. And that dissipates the fears that you have when you walk out of these doors. Now, just to give you a different idea... For those of you that don't live in downtown Baltimore, if I was to say I'm going to drop you off at midnight in the middle of a sketchy street, I'll see you tomorrow morning, your fears, if you're not from there and don't know the city, your fears would probably heighten, right? You might would call your mommy and say, Mommy, I need you to come get me, (laughs) right? I don't care how old you are, I still call my mommy. She's in the room right here, so I'd, I'd call her, right? Guys, when we are in our greatest places of security, it's when we feel the safest. And for us, we have this great conqueror, this great warrior who is on fighting on our behalf. The Roman Empire, if you uh, don't know much about it, was pretty crazy. Let me, let me read two, two quick verses for you really quick, and then I'm going to get into that. Look at this. As, in verse 36, as the scriptures say, for your sake we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. Now, Paul here is quoting Psalm 44. And the reason why that's significant is Psalm 44 is all about the people of God being persecuted. And now why that's significant is, and maybe this is prophetic in nature from Paul, but Paul is about to be in Rome and one of the most difficult times for Christians. Now, if you don't know anything about the Roman Empire, here it is in all of its glory. And around the first century is really when it was its greatest uh, at size. It was all the way up into Britain and Europe, all the way down into Asia and Africa. It, It consumed a lot of the world. It was the greatest empire up to that point. Now, the emperor who was ruling over that, was this little man by the name of Nero. Now, Nero was a mean dude. If you don't know anything or haven't read anything about Nero, I'd recommend going back and just Googling it. It's pretty terrible. Now, in July of 64 AD, a fire broke out in Rome, decimating 70% of Rome. Now, a lot of people thought, okay, Nero started this because 
He took the prime real estate after the fire was extinguished to build his new palace. So to change the viewpoint of people thinking it was his fault, he blames the Christians. The Christians started the fire. And for the next four years, from 64 AD to 68 AD, Nero slaughtered thousands of Christians. He had them crucified. He had them impaled on posts. He had them burned alive as torches. He had them fed to ravenous dogs in the arenas. Most scholars will say this is probably when Peter and Paul both were killed. Now what's interesting out of that story, and the reason why I tell you it, is because Paul is writing this, right? Despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours. Now in that moment, Paul did not experience victory. Most Christians in that moment didn't experience victory. But I want us to pause for a second and think about something. If you were to look around the room today, the Roman Empire doesn't exist anymore. It was defeated. It was beaten. It was conquered. And yet the church still does. You see, even though they may have conquered Christians for a minute, eternity is way longer. And the church will not be beaten. So Paul confidently wrote, writes, knowing knowing that he is probably facing death soon. And we have victory because of what Jesus has done. You see, Paul recognized that the love of God, the love of Christ, empowers us to overcome all the obstacles of life that come after us. Paul didn't come out with a sword and take everybody out. He recognized that the love of Christ was going to empower us to overcome, and maybe it's not as bad as a country coming to take us on, right? Most of us today, we're not worried about a country coming, coming to take over America. Maybe it's your job, your boss, your marriage, your friendships. The things in your life that are obstacles every single day that you have to beat. Well, you're, you beat it because the love of Christ indwells you, fills you, and it allows you to overcome all the obstacles that are put before you. Look at verse 38 and 39. If there were two verses of Scripture that I would tell you to memorize, these two would probably be two of them. I would never tell you to only memorize two verses of Scripture. There's a lot more. Anyways, look at verse 38. I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from the love of God, neither death nor life, angels or demons, Fears for today or worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No. Power in the sky, above, or the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. I ain't even got to preach that. I mean, that is something for us to just reflect on this morning. The beautiful truth that nothing, nothing can ever separate us from the love of God. You go, yeah, but look at all these terrible things. Death, life, angels, demons, all these awful things, Chris. Yeah. Last week, we said suffering is coming. It is going to come. But for a purpose. To conform us into the image of God to chisel out the things in our lives that don't look like him. Now, lest you think I skipped a verse, I did on purpose, if you're paying attention. Because the question that we have to answer to wrap this whole thing up is how do we know that God is for us? How do we know that what he's saying here is true? I think that's a fair question. I want you guys to look back at verse 31. I want us to see something really incredible that Jesus has provided the greatest sacrifice. He's provided the greatest sacrifice on our behalf. Look at verse 31. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare his, even his own son, 
but gave him up for us all. Won't he also give us everything else? There's a really cool Greek phrase. I don't use Greek and Hebrew that often because most of the time it's not super beneficial for you guys. But there's a really cool Greek phrase that I want you to see this morning that I love a whole lot. There's a Greek phrase that says this. Hatheos huper hemon. Now this Greek phrase, hatheos huper hemon, means this. God is for us. Now this is pivotal. It's the most succinct claim of the gospel. That God is for you this morning. How do we know? How can you prove that? Because of verse 32, right? Because he says that he gave up his own son. This is an allusion back to Genesis. Now, if you don't know the story in Genesis, it goes like this. There was a guy by the name of Abraham. Abraham waited 90 plus years for a child to be born. And finally, he had one, named him Isaac. Now, God looked down at Abraham and he said, Abraham, I'm glad you had this son. I need you to sacrifice him. And Abraham just said, okay. So him and Isaac load up and they travel. They go up to the top of the mountain and Isaac begins to realize something that they don't have anything to sacrifice. And you can imagine the thoughts going through his head. You can imagine that at some point, Abraham was probably like, you're the sacrifice. They get up to the top of the mountain. Abraham sets up the altar to sacrifice his son, his only son. And right before he does, God stops him, right? He says, no, 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 no. Don't sacrifice your son. Your faithfulness Your obedience is what I was looking for. And you nailed it. Here's a ram. Sacrifice the ram instead. Everybody comes out great outside of the ram, right? So he comes down the mountain, and and the story goes on. Abraham began to father many nations through Isaac and, and all of his sons beyond him. But what this text is saying, what Paul is alluding to, is that God spared Isaac. God did not spare Jesus. He sacrificed him for you and for me to pay a price for you and for me. And yet somehow, we still think that God will withhold from us. Somehow, God's saying, I'm drawing the line right here. I can't pay you anymore. I've never been to Disney World before. If any of you have and want to pay for me to go... I would love it. Yep. I think that'd be really great. We were supposed to go to Disney World, but I never got that trip, so I'm holding my parents to it. And eventually, I will go on their dime instead of mine. <laughs> now, Disney World, from what I hear, is, is fantastic, but it's also expensive. So imagine, for a second, that I go out, and I buy the plane tickets, and I get the park tickets, and I get all the things that I need in order to go, right? Hotels cars, day passes, food, everything. We land in Orlando, we get off the plane, we get our car, and we head to the park for the day. Now imagine that we're coming up to the park, and we see a sign that says, parking, $15. And I look at my wife and my kids, and I go, too far! (laughs) They have gone too far with this one. I draw the line at $15 for parking. Turn this thing around, we're going home. That's stupid, right? Maybe that happened to you as a kid, I don't know. But it's stupid, right? You've paid so much. Why, on something trivial, would you hold back? And yet, isn't this the picture that we sometimes paint of God? He has paid so much through Jesus, the sacrifice of his own son, and yet we still go, ah, God's holding out on me, though. God's looking at me going, too far. My grace can't go that, oh, you did that? Too far. You're out. As though somehow, in the midst of the trivial things, that God's going, I'm sorry. 
can't forget that. Romans 8 begins by talking about the fact that we have no condemnation any longer. It ends by saying that we are no longer separated from Jesus. In between, it gives us so many packed truths. But I want us to walk away with one this morning that is significant. This week, when you go home, everybody will go about their business. Sometimes life gets tough. And you feel like you're running on empty, that you're on fumes. But I want to share this truth with you this morning that I heard this week. That when your tank is empty and you feel like you're running on fumes, remember the tomb is empty. And that is the only thing that ought to get us through. If Jesus is still dead, then you're here in vain, friends. If Jesus is still in a grave somewhere, then we have no purpose in being here. But if Jesus is truly alive, as we claim he is, then he is worthy of every ounce of your life. He gave all for you, and all he asks in return is everything of you. Some of you have walked through this series with us all three weeks, and if you haven't, encourage you to go back and watch Pastor Matt's and last week's lesson as well and this week and I just I think about some of you this week maybe for you this has been a good three-week series of of reminders of exciting reminders that Christ has come that you are freed that you have hope that you are victorious that you can walk in confidence of who God is but maybe it's different for you maybe for you these three weeks or this morning alone instead serves as a, an eye-opening experience. An eye-opening experience to see how great God truly is in a way that maybe you've never experienced before. Our hope here is that you will experience the love of God in a powerful way. Our mission is to daily connect people with, with, with Christ with one another. We recognize that the love of God is best displayed through people. And so I hope that you've been able to see the love of God, that you are no longer condemned, that you have been made free, and that you will never be separated from the love of God. And if this morning you're walking through with a plane ticket that you're not sure if you're on standby or you can have the confidence that you have a seat don't leave this place with a question mark in your head. Come down front and grab one of our prayer team. Come out to the green wall and grab one of our pastors or one of our volunteers. Get somebody in your row and go, I need Jesus. There's no greater joy, no greater hope, no greater excitement and confidence than when you have Christ. Let me pray for us. Jesus, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the incredible freedom that we have in you, I ask this morning that you would be in this place, that your spirit would work, that you would transform lives, and that people would begin to see how great you are. God, if it's been a reminder for them these last couple of weeks how incredible you are, God, I pray that they would walk in that confidence this week. If this morning they just need you, if this morning they don't have any hope, they can't walk in confidence, they feel guilt and shame and condemnation, then Jesus I pray that you would not allow them to even walk out of these doors without getting right with you and, s and finally experiencing joy and hope in you. Jesus, we love you. We thank you. And we're hopeful for your return. And it's your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a great week, church.